uh, order, order. We now move to our second panel where we have uh, representatives from uh, Repair Advocates Restart Project, the Manufacturers Body Tech UK and campaigners from Electrical Safety First. So welcome to Martin Allen, Suzanne Baker, Perhaps I went silent. You did. I was just, I'm just going to ask our witnesses for the second panel to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Martin. Martin Allen from Electrical Safety First, and we are a consumer safety charity that aims to reduce death and injury caused by electricity in people's homes. Thank you, Martin. And Suzanne Baker. Hi, yes, I'm Susanna Baker and I'm um, Associate Director for uh, Climate, Environment and Sustainability at Tech UK. Uh, we're the Trade Association for Companies in the Digital Economy. Thank you. And Ugo Valori. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ugo Valori, co-founder and policy lead of the Restore Project. We are a charity and a people-powered social enterprise aiming to fix our relationship with electronics. Thank you very much indeed. So as my technology is not good, I'm going to ask some quick questions and then pass over to those who've got a better signal. Uh, first to uh, Suzanne, can you explain why it is that the collection and recycling targets that the UK government has set are not being met? Okay, so this is obviously a, a big question. Um, and I think one of the things that we haven't really dug into in much detail during the kind of discussion so far is that there's actually a lot of variability in a, a performance across the different um, targets, so or different product categories. So for display, we're recycling well over 60%. For IT and telecoms, for example, over 77% is being recycled. And this, a similar figure for consumer equipment where we have issues and challenges is actually around small mixed we and these are the products that um, are easily hoardable in homes and I think Libby mentioned the material focus research which indicated there are hundreds of thousands, millions of products hoarded away in people's homes um, and, and equally they're things that can be easily disposed of um, they can go into people's bins um, and I think the situation isn't really helped by the kind of model that we have at the moment in how we operate EPR. So um, uh, I think in the previous evidence or the, the previous sessions that you ran, um, there was a lot of discussion about predictability within the system and certainty for um, um, for um, actors within it. Um, and one thing for sure is that the competitive PCS system means that schemes aren't investing sufficiently in measures, um, for example, curbside collections and communications, because they lack the long-term visibility of the market share they will be representing in future. Um, and um, yeah, so one thing that we would certainly like to see is a rethink about how we organize collections. Um, and one approach which which is pretty popular in certain countries in Europe. So for example, Germany, Denmark, Italy, Ireland is, a, is what's called an allocation system. Yeah, so the allocation system um, essentially allocates local authority regions or rather regions of the countries to particular compliance schemes. And it allows them to have confidence to invest in, in particular areas. It also allows them to, um, um, I suppose, streamline the collections as well so they don't need so many lorries on the road. So um, I think it's a kind of combination of uh, com the competitive PCS environment, um, a lack of investment in um, hard to reach we, so the hoarded we, um, and smaller items, which um, are probably not going to be, householders aren't going to be so compelled to take to uh, the civic amenity sites. Um, a lack of uh, sufficient collection network, and we're very pleased to see that retailers from next year, large retailers will be required to take back we at the end of life. This is very common in pretty much all European countries, and for some reason we didn't do it in the UK. Um, so I think, you know, we are moving in the right direction, but we just got to make it easy for people to recycle these products. Hi, 
Hi, it's, it's Alex over here. I think Philip's having some problems with his um, Zoom. So I'm taking, I've literally just arrived back from London and turned my computer on. So um, I'm, I understand we've asked question 6A and um, has, has everybody who wants to answer um, six, six, the first part of question 6 answered it in terms of the witnesses? Or, and shall we move on? Or is there somebody else who wants to respond? this question i'm sorry i've literally 30 seconds ago joined the call so um suzanne are you have you, have you the first person to answer this question or somebody else yeah already? i was the first one Does do any of the others who would actually help me actually if one of you wanted to respond to this as well uh martin or Hugo, do either of you want to respond to this i would just uh, add to say that you know we recognize the important role that local authorities play in uh helping to recycle uh e-waste uh, they've done, you know, a, a great job in driving those those figures up. But our concern is actually the, the the selling on of those items. Many of the local authorities have got selling mechanisms in place, and it's very inconsistent in its approach. And you know that raises safety concerns, certainly for us selling substandard, unsafe products and recalled products as well. And I'm sure we'll go into the safety aspects of the conversation uh, as we go on. That, thank, thanks for that. Thanks for adding that. So I've I've, I've now up to speed. So, um, and thanks to the, the committee staff for bringing up speed. So, Suzanne, the, the Joint Trade Association is involved with setting the compliance fee. Yeah. We've heard this fee does not incentivize collection of hard to reach or expensive recycle e waste. We've heard that in previous sessions, nor does it promote better product design. Could the compliance fee system be reformed to act to bear incentive and actually resolve these problems that we've heard from, from the sector and from producers? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, we are, um, I chair a group called the JTA, uh, which is um, basically um, a group of uh, trade associations that uh, represent producers of uh, electricals and electronic equipment. Um, for the past five years, we've been one of the uh, actors that put forward a proposal for the compliance fee. In fact, anyone can put forward a proposal um, that is then subject to a consultation um, and scrutiny by DEFRA. Um, and um, in, what we have to do is we have to design the proposal uh, um, to be compliant with guidelines that DEFRA have um, produced. Uh, one of those is that they are based on actual costs. So um, we do, we are limited in, in being able to only frame the compliance fee based on the costs that are being um, faced by um, schemes at present. Um, so um, I think it's it's complicated, um, but I think it's important, you know, going back to the previous point uh, around the target setting, I think one benefit of the compliance fee is that the funds can be put to really good use and be invested in um, uh, activity which schemes themselves um, are unable to do um, uh, because of the, their competitive nature. So for, for example, there was a, a bit a long discussion in the previous section around brominated flame retardants. And actually one of the first studies that were um, funded by the compliance fee was to actually assess brominated flame retardants in legacy wee plastics. And that is what has prompted uh, the Environment Agency to revise its guidelines. Um, and there are uh, controls now in place to make sure that plastic that are contaminated with those um, um, chemicals are being dealt with in the right way um, and those that are found to be contaminated um, are being sent to high temperature incineration in sites that are permitted to, to do that and the Environment Agency has been following this extremely closely and even to the point that they were involved in the design of the methodology of the actual study itself. Um, there, with, it's, there's a lot of investment also in communications um, and um, curbside collections and other collection points too. So I think there is some good that can come out of the compliance fee, um, um, but whether it will affect design, I don't think so. So one of the things that the government's considering at the moment and looking at is the introduction of eco-modulated fees. So we've seen in the industrial strategy, the clean growth strategy, the 25 year environment plan, the resources and waste strategy, this commitment from government that it would try and encourage producers to design better products. The idea behind eco-modulation is that producers who put on the market good products pay less 
um, than the producers of, pro of bad products. Um, how you define that, I think, is still um, up for debate, and um, DEFRA is certainly considering the what criteria it might be used, but we think that might be a sensible way to reward good design. Um, the the re initial kind of framing for the criteria is with, um, DEFRA is looking at um, durability, repairability, hazardous substances, and recycled content. Um, so um, I think it's definitely coming, um, um, but I still believe that um, eco-design legislation itself is going to be the most effective means to encourage design change. That's, that's really helpful to know that it's insufficient and we need further, further reforms. Um, Ugo, do you want to come in on this point as well? Anything to add? Yes, um, I wanted to add that uh, we see two problems from our perspective in the compliance fee as, as it is managed at the moment. On the one hand, um, evidently, as the law uh, requires that the fee is set at uh, a level that actually encourage uh, compliance by collection, clearly this is not working and uh, it should be very clear, evidently the fee is not uh, giving that um, incentive. But the second problem and with ref referring to what Suzanne was saying is actually the, the fund itself, um, it, because of the way it's currently managed, it represents uh, the views only of the manufacturers. And that uh, probably has an impact in how it doesn't necessarily contribute to um, uh, assessing uh, projects that could contribute to the whole waste hierarchy. For example, we have seen that there are strong incentives uh, for recycling, but perhaps some of these funds could actually be more directly aiming at increasing uh, reuse, for instance. A lot more than happens now. Great. So um, that, thanks for that. Um, I, I think Philip's back online now, but I'm going to hand over to Ian for his questions, and then I think Philip will then take over subsequently. But thanks very much for that and hopefully I won't be called upon again. But Ian, over to you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. And uh, that's the perfect time when you joined the meeting there. I couldn't have been done better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ugo, um, I often get asked what motivated me to become a politician. Thank and you, Alex. That's a, a completely different story. Uh, we could talk all day about that. But if you wouldn't mind, in your own words, what motivated you to, um, to start the Restart project? If you wouldn't mind, just, just in your own words, a bit of a snapshot. Yeah, well, thanks for the question. Uh, so we, we've been all looked into uh, progressively losing our right to tinker and uh, repair the products that we already own. And this has happened in a way silently. We haven't really been fully aware that we were losing progressively all of this. And we started Restart uh, with the intention of bringing repair back into our communities and when it was becoming harder and harder to even find uh, commercial uh, options. And this country has a wonderful tradition of engineering and repair was at the heart of, of the UK and uh, it wasn't the case anymore. We were losing our skills and true ownership of the things uh, we own. We started in London running uh, our first uh, community repair event, we called them Restart Parties, on a summery afternoon in June, exactly eight years ago. And uh, at the time uh, we, we helped uh, participants, uh, our, our wonderful volunteers to give a second lease of life to things that people thought were going to be lost. I, I'll always remember the person that cycled for six miles to come to our first event carrying a printer on her bike and went back home happy. And, and we shouldn't really underestimate how people's frustration for not really being fully in control of products that they have bought and it's been lost. And now we are part of a much bigger global community, which is resisting the throwaway economy and trying to promote alternative, better ways. Repair is about stupid and care. It links people, it creates value, and it's an essential part of being human. 
polling in the UK as well as in Europe and the United States shows that people overwhelmingly want to repair and they want the barriers to repair to be removed. It's a wildly popular agenda that unites people across the whole political spectrum. And repair jobs uh, that can be created through, uh, through repair are, are excellent. And the skills and the future of repair jobs are, however, under serious threat. Uh, looking beyond repair, uh, a repairer's creative problem-solving mentality is crucial to many of the jobs of the future. And that's why, uh, while we started deeply rooted in community activity, we actually are promoting and aiming for a universal right to repair so that independent repair businesses as well as people in communities can repair unnecessary waste. Thank you. So, so Ugo, kind of following on from that, um, our family are farmers and Robert was talking earlier about a, a gear selector on a, uh, on a tractor and a moisture meter for, for the grain that, that he, he, he was able to, uh, able to get repaired in the end. And just last weekend, we have a uh, one of these battery-powered hoovers, you know, these vacuum cleaners you hang on the wall. I'll not say the name, but they're very powerful. And it went off. So I took it, to, took it apart myself and fiddled with it. And every part in there was metal, apart from the main gearbox cog, which was plastic. And one ran against the other and obviously just ground the plastic away until the main the main sort of like um, beta bar on the front of the vacuum cleaner didn't turn anymore. So it had to be thrown away. It couldn't be repaired. And to me, that was actually built so that it couldn't be repaired because it was an, in almost a sealed unit. So I'm wondering what products do you think are generally safe to repair? Or should, I mean, I tinkered with that and I'm sure Robert tinkers as well with some of the stuff that he's got on the farm. But I'm wondering, is there certain products that you would say should be more specifically allocated to a to a, a qualified repairer or is it something that can be done in in the home by a bit of an odd job man we're waiting that everyone should repair everything themselves if they do not have the skills and the experience and the volunteers that power all the community repair movement activities at repair cafes and parties across the uk and the world are very experienced and talented and extremely careful about the safety. Uh, that said, uh, we there was a time where everyone was able to at least rewire a plug and we've lost touch with all of this. And it is indeed true that uh, there is uh, a, a increasingly not so much like a uh, planned obsolescence the way people think that products are designed so the day after the warranty expires uh, to stop working but there are deliberate choices made by manufacturers to make it hard for people to replace uh, a component and, you know it could be uh, a piece of uh, like a glue uh, preventing you to from repairing the battery on your smartphone, for example. Yeah. Um, and so while most of our events uh, actually focus on primarily um, battery powered devices, it is entirely possible uh, if the person is skilled and experienced and knows what they're doing to actually repair at these events also means devices. Obviously, safety comes first with everyone. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think Martin wanted to come in there. Did... Yeah, I was just going to build on what I was saying that, you know, the strategy draw the line in terms of risk. You know, if you're replacing a, a battery in a smoke detector that I only had to do the, the other day, it started bleeping, so I replaced it, it was quite easy to do used to be able to replace batteries in phones, but you can no longer do that. So you either go to the manufacturer or you take it to a third party provider who may be able to do it cheaper and more, more efficient, more, more quickly. But you know, the other extreme is, would you feel comfortable, confident in repairing a tumble dryer, fridge, freezer? You know, why good fires we see in the news for all the wrong reasons on a daily basis, you know, electricity, that causes fires in the homes year on year. So it's where you draw the line in terms of risk. Replacing a plastic part, yes, that should be achievable and that shouldn't be, you know, uh, ultimately result in the product having to be sort of destroyed. But when it gets into electrical safety, it's a very different matter. So for me, the conversation's all around safety, which Hugo made that point quite nicely. 
Uh, Suzanne, maybe, maybe you might be able to help me a little bit with this one, because um, as, we, as, as we leave the, the, the COVID pandemic period, um, we're obviously going to be entering a period of quite high unemployment. And I'm wondering if, bearing in mind what Ugo and Martin have said, do you think that maybe we could use the, the, the facilities in maybe schools, colleges, night schools to, to, to bring in um, maybe maybe lessons to encourage people to, to get a basic understanding? Uh, I mean, Martin talked about repairing, a, you know, changing a plug. It's something with my kids. I've made a point of showing them how to do it so that you know we can all do it but i think some of those skills get a little bit lost as well so i'm just wondering what, what the panel think really and suzanne maybe if you want to go first what you what you think about the um the, the ability to train people up so they can do some basic repairs yeah it's an interesting point um so um i think we're we're lacking in the UK in skills across a whole range of um, fields. Um, it, it, for Tech UK's perspective, digital skills is, is a massive issue and we'd love to see more training on that. And I think engineering skills um, um, goes in the same bucket. Um, well, one of the things that Material Focus um, is planning to do is to test a schools program with the charity Global Action Plan. So I think that should definitely be something they can consider as part of that um, trial with, with schools. Yeah. And any any of the panel want to come in on that as well? It's, uh... for, for me, it would be a case of not just the skills to do the job. It's actually what parts are you going to, to use? You know, we see on, if you Google anything and you go to one of the online marketplaces, whether it's eBay or Amazon, if you Google an iPhone battery, there'll be hundreds and hundreds of replacements available to you. Almost all of them will not be approved by the brand themselves, yeah. but you can install them. Someone will come with instructions how to replace it. So it's control of the, the online marketplace, which is really fundamental to this issue as well. It's not just the skills of the person. It's actually the quality and safety of those components that are available. You know, And I'm sure people buy them because they're cheaper than those that are available from the manufacturer. But the online marketplace is certainly an area to explore. Yeah. Ugo, did you want to... Yes, uh, this is a brilliant point, and actually, I, I'd like to, to mention what are the three pillars of a true right to repair that we uh, would like to happen in legislation in the UK, uh, as well as in the rest of the world. And they are, first, access to spare parts, affordable spare parts uh, for all products to everyone. Exactly so that Martin's point actually is uh, taken care of because often people are not able to choose and they cannot access even the parts from the manufacturers themselves. It, it often happens and so this is an opportunity to change this by requiring by legislation that uh, all manufacturers provide for the whole lifetime of a product a, access to spare parts for everyone. The second thing which actually ensures um, safe repairs done by everyone is access to the official repair manuals so that products can be repaired using the best knowledge available, which obviously will be the one that's provided by the manufacturer. And the third point, um, which is a crucial pillar, is that products should be designed to be repairable to begin with. And uh, Martin made, gave the example of the smartphones that previously didn't, uh, well, we could have, in the past, we could swap the battery. Actually, uh, it, it was the choice to make products uh, smaller. Actually, some manufacturers are making products that are marginally thicker, but perfectly with perfectly user replaceable batteries. And so this can change, uh, but there aren't sufficient incentives unless uh, we require all manufacturers minimum standards. Yeah, and I think your point there that you had about the, uh, the repair manual, uh, to, even to have a repair manual online would be fantastic. Um, Suzanne? 
Yeah, so under the eco-design regulations that were discussed in the last session, some of the resource efficiency measures that were brought in for the products, the first suite of products being considered in the um, in that package, um, we saw the introduction of requirements for manufacturers to hold spare parts for seven to ten years, uh, to provide repair information to professional repairers, um, and to ensure that products can be dis um, repaired using commonly available tools. Um, so we are starting to see legislation uh, being brought in that, that address many of the points that Ugo mentioned there. That's lovely. Yeah, Ugo, sir? I, yeah. I would only add uh, that, uh, unfortunately, this legislation will not be automatically adopted by the UK. And so we still do not know uh, whether the UK will adopt similar legislation. And this uh, covers only uh, an initial set of products. So it's encouraging. It's, uh, it's been a globally recognized first the crucial precedent for right to repair um, to, to gain traction worldwide. Um, but there is one third problem, which is that the, the focus on uh, who can access. And so I'm we not are, to watch that. The third point was there is a, a third aspect, which is who can access uh, repair manuals as well as yeah. spare parts, and that's why we are campaigning for a universal right to repair, so that it's not just professional um, repairers, but everyone that could actually increase everyone's safety by not using third party, not necessarily as accurate sources of information. And I'll give you one example, which is very relevant. About three years ago, we ran one of our restart parties at Perculli's house, and uh, uh, we took approximately two hours to take apart Dan Blender on Bell and Hayes MP, and had only access, been able to access the official manufacturer-run uh, repair manual, it would have taken us five minutes. And when you think about this, and the global aspects of what this means is actually an increase in the cost of repair if you're in it um, uh, at a professional level. And, but for everyone, a lot of time wasted an opportunity that uh, are not taking uh, yeah. maximum advantage of. I mean, on, on a lighter note, I, I took that vacuum cleaner apart. I found out what the problem was, but even if I'd been able to get the part, I couldn't have put it back together. <laughs> So, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Ian. I think that takes us nicely on to the whole issue of intellectual property rights, uh, which I think Nadia Wittem is going to cover in her questions. Nadia, can you unmute? Thanks. Thanks. Um, I've got a few questions. Firstly, for, for you, Suzanne, and then a couple of follow ups. Um, Research shows that consumers want products to be more durable. In your understanding, are electronic producers taking action to make their products more durable and more reliable? Or are you finding that they're inherently reluctant to promote initiatives if this means that their sales might be reduced? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, so what we have seen is for products like smartphones, for example, um, the whole life of them of a smartphone um, has extended slightly um, in the last decade. And that's partly because of design changes, um, because um, a lot of the initial failures with smartphones were because of water or dust ingress. Um, and so some of the concerns that Ugo mentioned around not being um, um, the kind of units being sealed um, it ha have been introduced uh, to um, uh, really look at and try and improve the durability of the product. So there is a little bit of a trade-off. Um, you can design for durability, but, but that has actually impacted um, design for uh, repairability. Um, as in turn. Um, I think the other kind of really interesting trend that we're, we're starting to see, um, and it goes to some of the discussions that we heard yesterday, um, or rather this morning around um, leasing models. Um, so um, some um, quite large manufacturers, um, for example, HPE, have said that they're going to move entirely to a product as a service model um, by 2022. Um, so all their products and services will be available as a service 
um, rather than buying it directly. Um, and we know that that in, in itself will be a strong incentive for product durability um, because the product remains within the control of the manufacturer throughout the kind of entire life cycle. Um, so um, there have been some moves um, and um, I think we can see some more um, to come. So over the last three years, uh, manufacturers and NGOs um, and ex industry experts have been working on a whole suite of new standards um, that will have basically set out a methodology for measuring durability um, of a product. Um, it's, uh, we've also got standards for repairability and for upgradability, ability to remanufacture. So the first, for the first time, we'll have actual methodologies to assess these characteristics in products. Um, and I think um, in turn, once these are all complete, um, we can start to see them being much, much more embedded into future eco-design regulation in, in turn. That's really helpful. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and then that brings me on to the next question for Ugo about big tech companies. To what extent do you find that these companies have been supportive or obstructive when it comes to the right to repair? Yeah, uh, industry clearly feels by all of the three pillars of repair, the for repair, access to repair documentation, and access to spare parts. They have actually fought tooth and nail every step of the way. Um, teams of lobbyists in the United States, for example, go from state to state uh, with a chorus of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, uh, trying to prevent state legislation to be passed. The similar arguments happened in, in Europe. And we know that in the US, uh, people have been threatened uh, with localized job losses. I mean, lawmakers have been threatened with localized job losses in case uh, right to repair legislation would happen. In, in Europe, they tried the death by a thousand cuts strategy in relation to regulation. There are big companies with pioneering projects in this area, but they're not at the heart of the business strategy. They're, they're, they're not really at the heart of what they're working on. And um, industry, unfortunately, is also using the COVID crisis at the moment as an opportunity to attempt to delay and block all forms of progressive uh, regulation, even in relation to pollution, to recycling, let alone right to repair. And we're also seeing a growing threat that actually comes from the role that software uh, can play in all of this. So how software can uh, further limit uh, product repairability depending on some software locks applied. Thank you, Ugo. Um, this is primarily for Suzanne, but um, if the other witnesses have anything to say on this, then please feel free to, to chip in. Um, on intellectual property rights, how do you think tech companies could maintain their intellectual property rights whilst at the same time making repair more accessible for consumers? Um, so I can point to some developments that we've seen recently where manufacturers have uh, tried to do just that. So for example, Samsung now offers a service where you can book a repairer to come to your home um, at a convenient time. Um, they're increasingly using things like um, IoT, the Internet of Things, so they can remotely diagnose problems with, uh, with mobiles um, and smartphones. Um, and uh, we are seeing uh, more um, manufacturers and I suppose the other kind of um, kind of important um, point in the chain for things like smartphones is the kind of mobile the telecom providers as well so um, people like Vodafone for example you can pop into their sh a store and, and get things repaired so I think we are seeing more innovation in 
the ability to offer repair. Um, Sony, for example, they they can offer, they basically can offer, they have a, a repair a facility in Wales um, and they have a commitment to return, repair and return products within 48 hours, which is quite astonishing. So um, I think we are seeing uh, manufacturers respond to um, some of the barriers um, that others have mentioned around repair. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, just lastly for Ugo then, but as always, if anyone else wants to chip in, please do. I know that Apple is trying to make its products more sustainable and offer repairs in its own Apple Repair Centre. Why is it a problem if companies reserve the right to do their own repairs and don't make their products generally repairable? Yeah, so Apple, let's not forget, has made over 2 billion iPhones from the beginning of the iPhone product line. Uh, even if you add all of its authorized repair centers, it simply cannot repair all of them. Uh, for example, imagine being somewhere in rural Scotland or Wales, and it will take quite a bit of time to get your phone sent and received back. What they're also doing uh, by providing the services they currently do is basically uh, bringing us at risk of creating a monopoly. And I'll give you a specific example. If you look at their website, the only repairs that they list uh, are screens and batteries. And uh, for all other repairs, they quote the cost of half the price of a brand new device in case you had to have the repair done. And additionally, um, they are putting software locks that are already printing non-authorized repair businesses from performing the repairs uh, that uh, some of the same repairs. So we've seen up a lot of progress on of the low hanging fruit through sustainability initiatives, uh, data centers, uh, the, the use of recycled aluminum in some of their products as waste in assembly facility. But big elephant in the room, the overall carbon and material footprint in manufacturer manufacturing it has long and very very long-term goals related to all of this but all of them are linked to this delusion that they will control and close all of the loops around uh, repair and ultimately they are under severe ordinary pressure from their uh, shareholders apple clearly sees controlling repair as an opportunity to make money of services and promote consumption of new devices in primary markets. Some of the issues that were raised earlier by uh, Martin around the uh, lack of availability, well, uh, uh, about the, the type of uh, unofficial spare parts are also partly on the market, are partly due to what happens at the moment where non-authorized Apple uh, repairers do not have access to the same diagnostics and same parts. And that, uh, sure, in the United States, there is now um, an independent repair program, but this is risking causing a full monopoly based on the price that Apple gives to act for access to all of these parts. So I don't want to be in a situation where potentially having to replace a microphone in a phone, according to the manufacturer, it would require replacing the whole phone potential and paying for half of the original price. I don't think this is in the interest of consumers and the planet. Thank you. Suzanne, did you want to pitch in? Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, a, a, a possible policy incoherence, um, which I think is worth flagging. Um, at the moment, um, legislation requires manufacturers to conduct risk assessments for their products for um, all of its use and for all of its life. Um, and there is a um, uh, directive, the product liability directive, which essentially gives recourse to consumers if anything goes wrong. Um, equally, um, 
sense, um, you know, if, any, if anything does go wrong, if there's a component, for example, that um, is found uh, later to be not safe, um, um, there is um, you know, a, a kind of parallel debate about how you get those products back and, and how we can have an effective product recall system. If I go back to the product liability directive, the, the commission reviewed um, the directive in, in 2018. Um, and in its own review, it said that it would need it needs to be looked at in the context of a more sustainable economy in which products are refurbished, patched and reused. Who will be the manufacturer of such pro products, e.g. in the case of repair, reuse and refurbishment? At the moment, when manufacturers have liability for the product for its entire life, you know, you're always going to have a situation where they are going to be protective of um, that product to minimise um, safety risks. And I think oh. it would be well worth looking at if we want to encourage a circular economy in the UK too. Th thank you, Nadia. I mean, just on that point, Suzanne, that feeds back into the point being made about uh, having a, a leasing model products as a service, because there the manufacturer would retain responsibility. It would be, you mentioned uh, HPE. Yep. Um, it would be very helpful if you could write to the committee with some examples of British companies that are uh, going down this route, in particular, sort of innovative companies, as well as the established ones. I'd be very happy to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. And now uh, Claudia Webb has some questions on safety. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, indeed, I do. Uh, maybe this question would be for Martin. But Martin, I wonder if you can outline your safety concerns about the current system uh, of e-waste management in the UK. Well, we it's. it's Two sides, really. One's from local authorities, who we mentioned before, are doing a great job in driving up recycling numbers. But we uh, carried out some work last year using freedom of information and wrote to all the local authorities who are carrying out uh, sort of reselling of, of electrical uh, products. And it was about 24 that are actually into that sort of process, trying to proactively sort of sell uh, e-waste, e so they get them back into the, the communities, which is an admirable thing. However, there's only four of them who actually had any sort of system in place for checking safety. That's even basic electrical safety checks. And even as far as to see, to check whether a product had been subject to a product recall. So they were sort of, you know, facilitating putting recall products back into the community, which is clearly not a great thing to do. So, you know, we, we, we believe, firmly believe that, that they need, if they're going to be into that market, which is an admirable thing to do, but there needs to be a lots of transparency and consistency. There needs to be best practice guidance developed. And we are actually engaged with the uh, local government association and, and they were not both coming in, sort of getting involved to develop best practice. So we'd like to, you know, help give them a nudge to, to get to engage and actually develop that guidance for local authorities, as well as providing guidance for consumers so that they know what they can and can't recycle in their particular area and also understand what happens to their items once they have disposed of them or thinking that they've handed them over to the, to the site. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on that, um, but let me, I've got a further question um, to that. Um, you, you've highlighted the problem of electrical um, or electric electronics being resold um after they've been deposited at household waste and recycling uh, centers without safety checks what changes would you actually uh, like to see to prevent uh, this happening so we, we want to see and that, that one that one probably still with with martin yeah it's it's to develop a, a sort of transparent process that's you know to deliver consistency across all local authorities at the moment that just does not exist so we believe that there needs to be guidance that all local authorities can sort of under read understand and actually implement in their processes so it's a consistent uh, system to get uh, recycled products back into the community that have been safety checked and certainly if they've been recalled then they need to be taken out of circulation and handed back to the to the manufacturer okay but at the moment, um, we've tried to engage with the local government association and they've not been so forthcoming. So any help that the committee can give to 
help that along its way, then would be greatly appreciated. And 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 I mean, I think that that's a good point, actually. Perhaps this committee um, could um, write to the local government association and raise this as an issue. Um, but I also wondered. Um, whether or not in terms of the management of those um, household waste and recycling centers whether or not um the 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 regional waste authorities um are also uh, uh, organizations that we ought to also uh, raise this issue with as well because they're obviously managing those uh, recycling centers with uh, local authorities i don't know what your engagement with 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 the with those bodies have been um primarily it's been with the with the lga but we we've, we've been looking at regional uh engagement as well because it's been difficult to engage with the with the lga uh the recycling centers as well i should make the point that they do a great job in preventing uh consumers from just selling them on online marketplaces you know getting rid of their unwanted items through the online marketplaces so again, you know, it's, it's, it's in everybody's interest to have a centralized system that can control recycling of, of e-waste uh, e rather than just allowing consumers to do their own thing and sell them through online marketplaces. Because again, we, we see time and time again, second-hand products being sold that are you know, unsafe and subject to a product recall, you know, that has to change. Okay, um, Philip, that, that ends my question, but I with, just with a, a reference that perhaps this committee um, it, seeks that evidence from local government association and indeed the waste authorities that manage some of these recycling um, house, household waste and recycling centres with local authorities. Thank you, Claudia. I see Hugo in, indicating, but I'm good, perhaps uh, Shailesh could bring Hugo in in his questions, which are good follow up. Shailesh Farah. Uh, certainly. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, continuing on the theme of safety, but narrowing it down to the actual suppliers. Uh, what we have at the moment is increasingly spare parts are available on Amazon and other online marketplaces. Um, clearly there's a safety issue here with non-authorized parts. So what would you suggest can be done to regulate the actual supply uh, in the first place uh, from these sources that are selling uh, to the public? Uh, perhaps Martin could answer first, and then perhaps Ugo could come in afterwards. Yeah, I mean, we, we everything we ever see that that's deemed to be sort of substandard uh, or counterfeit, or even recall, we we find them time and time again on online marketplaces, and increasingly so, in particular during the current situation where you know until recently all the shops have been closed, then almost all of our retail has been done online. I mean, we believe that that. Uh, the sale and control of, of uh, electrical products ought to be included in the online harms bill. Uh, the marketplaces see themselves as outside of the product safety regulatory system. They don't concern themselves to be retailers. They just facilitate us of that trade. And I think, you know, that, that needs to end. They need to sort of uh, be brought into that process and be accountable for some of the products that they're allowing to be sold by their third party sellers. Uh, you know, they've been taking, you know, money from consumers for many, many years, very, very profitable. It's a business is continuing to grow, but they need to be brought into the product regulatory system. And we think one step towards doing that is that having them an extension on the online harms bill that's been sort of going through at the moment to, to include the sale of electrical goods as well. But wouldn't the uh, suppliers come back to you and say, but, you know, they are supplying online spare parts, as we've discussed, but they're also supplying furniture and a whole lot of other items. So they couldn't possibly be uh, responsible for regulation for every single item that Amazon or other marketplaces flag. I'm just being devil's advocate here in terms of what they are likely to say. So coming back to the specifics of the subject that we're discussing, uh, is there anything else that you might be able to do um perhaps even at the level before amazon gets its products uh just to, to sell them i mean for it, to give an, an example that we actually tested uh ourselves uh we were able to set ourselves up as a, as a seller of electrical products called dangerous electrical without any question whatsoever we were able to uh report to be selling a, a recalled item with a, a serial number and model number that was on 
uh, a large manufacturer's website without any trouble whatsoever. Uh, so that, that's the current situation. We would like to see that if those type of products are not even allowed to be sold. So that, again, those online marketplaces to put measures in place to require model, serial number, even put up a pop-up alert if you put a, you had a, a, a hot point uh, tumble dryer that we've seen in the press for all the, all the wrong reasons. And again, there's no alert mechanisms in place and that can be done quite quickly. You know, another one is using uh, algorithms or image recognition that they use for other systems like, like, um, like knives and weapons and so on. You could do that for some of the, the recalled items by putting choice words and have it as a filter that had a pop-up. We see plugs that are clearly substandard. You don't need to be genius to see a plug that's got, uh, it's undersized or it's got no fuse. That could be picked up by technology quite easily uh, without the consumer having to buy those products and then you know, be forced with an unsafe item in their, in their house. So there's a lot of technology is the winner here and, and the online marketplaces need to make better use of it. Right. Uh, Ugo, I see Ugo wants to come in. So please, over to you. Yeah wanted to um, add to this point because Martin is absolutely right that uh, unsafe parts or products should not be sold or resold. Um, we should, however, be careful and uh, avoid cases where potential reuse of refurbished spare parts, for example, or products could fall under, under this as well. So uh, I think People should be able to know when they're buying a part, whether it's a genuine part from the manufacturer or a compatible part, or if it's refurbished, meaning that it uses previously used, uh, well, components. But it's also a matter of making repair affordable. And so uh, we should avoid a situation where a manufacturer has full control over the supply chain, setting up prices for spare parts um, that are actually not, uh, that might be making the difference between a product being theoretically repairable and actually being repaired. And at the same time, uh, in the previous session, it was mentioned uh, that the, the, the best thing to do with a product um, is to reuse before we recycle and so at, at times when a full product is no longer reusable but some of the parts could be and and so let's let's keep that in mind uh, in finding transparent and open ways to take care of this um i see that suzanne wants to come in uh, before i um go to suzanne could i ask a second question and suggest that suzanne also picks that one up as well as well as the first one for the simple reason that i think we've got about five minutes left and I know that there's one other question. So Suzanne, could you come in on the second one and, and, and the first one as well? Um, how, how would you suggest that uh, uh, moves towards a circular economy be made compatible with strict health and safety measures for electrical and electronic equipment? I mean, that's another issue in terms of circular economy. So uh, if I go over to Suzanne first, and then perhaps Martin could take over as well. Uh, but very briefly, please, because I know uh, somebody else wants to come in. Yeah, I'll be very quick. So um, firstly, on the, the, the point around the cost of spare parts, um, there was actually a report published this week by the Commission to inform its thinking for eco-design for um, a smart uh, smartphones and laptops. Um, and what it found was that um, it's uh, the, the biggest differentiator for the cost um, of repair was actually the cost of labour. So it goes back, I think, to the points that Libby and others said in the previous session, that if we could introduce the AT cuts for labour, we could make repair much more affordable. Um, and in terms of making uh, repair safe, I think we would like to see a level playing field in the um, level of safety that's required of repairers as well as um, uh, manufacturers. So um, why would repair operations have weaker standards than the uh, the standards that manufacturers have to work towards. So I think we're looking for a more regulated repair industry, which might actually address some of the trust issues that, that were mentioned in um, by Libby in her report. Okay. Martin, do you want to come back quickly before I hand over to Philip again for the last question? Or yeah, if you, I, I would you don't have to come back if it's been covered. So I would you agree with Suzanne that the regulated system uh, we need for, for repairers at the moment. It's, uh, it's the Wild West in many cases. Uh, so, you know, these people, 
there are certain jobs that need lower level skills, but there are certain complex uh, examples that we mentioned at the very start that need specialist skills. And so we need to find a way of having a, a, an extended process where things can be repaired, but the people carrying out those repairs need to be competent for the task in hand and also have accessible uh, access to, uh, for, to the components so that the, the repairs are done safely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, but thank you, Shailesh. Uh, and thank you for keeping that um, commendably concise. Uh, our last set of questions are from uh, Jerome Mayhew, and I think that just with a quick word from Duncan Baker after Jerome. Jerome. I'm, I'm going to be very quick because we've, we're, we're running very short of time. So the new environment bill enables the government to introduce an extended uh, producer responsibility system that charges different fees depending on the impact of different products. Uh, and we're kicking off with uh, one and with packaging. But what would you like to see included in the design of uh, any future EPR uh, or EEE? Uh, I should point that towards Suzanne to begin with, and then perhaps Hugo, you might want to come in. Um, so I think earlier I mentioned that um, uh, some of the criteria that were being considered for eco-modulation for um, um, E. Um, I think what we would really push for is for the criteria to be internationally aligned. Uh, we risk a situation where different countries pick different criteria and you'll be pulling the manufacturer in all sorts of different directions. So international alignment on those criteria is absolutely vital. Uh, we'd also like to see stronger incentives um, and some recognition for those manufacturers who are actually deploying circular economy business models um, because that isn't uh, reflected um, at all in, in the current WE system. Um, so we're thinking through options, but we think more can be done there too. And Hugo, have you got a quick comment on that? Yes. Um, so while obviously the design uh, regulations uh, that Libby was referring to are at the heart of pushing for products that are more longer lasting and for EPR uh, with modulated can contribute to show uh, also in a way at the moment when people are purchasing a product whether a product is more or less um, repairable for example so we think that the ease of repairability as well as the ease of disassembly of a product should be a part of this and the modulation should be sufficiently wide as to actually this more visible actually an extra point that Stems from uh, the experience of, of France, uh, which is now moving towards having um, a percentage, a 5% of the EPR uh, to be contributing to a fund that can reduce the cost of repair of products. And is a very interesting approach. Uh, Suzanne earlier mentioned uh, that the vast uh, part of repair costs have to do with labor costs. Uh, it would depend on the parts. Um, but certainly uh, reduction via either uh, VAT reduction or um, specifically uh, tax breaks could help. Let's not forget that many small scale independent repairs might be below the VAT threshold, yeah. so it doesn't necessarily contribute to everyone. Yeah. So I'm going to pick up on the incentives and leave uh, modulated fees for my colleague, Mr. Baker. But it's really whether you like carrots or sticks. Uh, do you believe that uh, a system of incentives is the most effective way to drive improvements in de product design? Or should we be getting the big stick out and relying on regulations uh, that would require designs for circularity? Uh, experience I... showed. Oh, no, you, 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 you start. Okay. Well, experience uh, shows that uh, the incentives, uh, the market doesn't seem to come with sufficiently uh, ambitious uh, steps forward. And uh, as an example, I could mention the uh, voluntary agreements uh, that exist at European level for, for example, game console and uh, imaging and uh, printers manufacturers that have not really been particularly ambitious in. And so, Act availability of uh, but, regulations but, that set minimum standards. But Hugo, isn't that, isn't that not, sorry, Hugo, for interrupting? Isn't that a question of the size of the incentive, not the concept of incentives working? So the question is there there would always be some manufacturers that choose shortcuts if they can, 
and yeah. they might not be the ones represented by Tech UK, but there might be others that actually try to enter a market with substandard products. And regulation's role is to prevent the lowest performing products to even on the market. And there are additional incentives, uh, set, for example, a reparability score index, as France has just adopted, that can help uh, consumers towards more repair products, for example. Martin, do you have anything to add on that? I was just going to make the point before about as more and more products be become uh, internet enabled, mm. and not just necessarily the product itself that needs to be considered in this conversation, but it's the, the longevity of the software that supports the operation right. of those products as well. So yeah. that's another part in that as more products become connectable. And Suzanne, the final word on this question. Yeah, I just wanted to add in something that hasn't been mentioned so far, and that's the role of public procurement. Uh, DEFRA is currently reviewing its sustainable ICT strategy to help guide um, government's um, own purchasing of ICT. Um, and um, we've seen um, in, in, in Europe, they're currently reviewing their green public procurement criteria, for, a, a, um, for example, for laptops. Um, and um, in, in the US, they have a system called EPIT, which basically ranks a whole range of electronics on a gold, silver or bronze scaling, depending on its ability to meet a whole a host of criteria, sustainability criteria. I think yeah. we could do more of that in the UK. Okay, and uh, Hugo, you've got a quick, just a quick mention if you would. Yeah, uh, just a quick follow up to Martin's point. Uh, software is indeed a, a huge problem going forward for all kinds of connected devices, which is becoming every device. And DCMS has actually an interesting proposed law to require manufacturers in the UK, uh, well, in, to enter the UK market to make very clear what is the minimum amount of support for software for software and security yeah. updates. We'd like to make sure that that is extended to all products, including smartphones, which are the de facto connected product to begin Great. with. Great. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand straight over to Mr. Baker. Thank you. Thank you. I'd rather use the big stick that um, uh, Mr. Mayhew mentioned because I think time is of the essence uh, here and it's not, uh, things do not necessarily get expediated with an incentive. An industry seems to always find a way uh, to work around stipulations rather than having regulations. But as the final question um, to Suzanne, how important will it be to harmonise modulated fees uh, across different countries? Uh, and how would you like to see the UK approach this, uh, remembering that, of course, uh, we will no longer be part of the European Union? Yeah, I think it's a, a really good and important question. I think if modulated fees are going to have any impact um, on the design of electronics, they have to be harmonised internationally. Um, so uh, we would recommend DEFRA put off making a decision until the European Commission publishes its guidelines for member states um, in December. Um, and equally, we are also uh, very supportive of continuing to align with your on eco-design standards as well. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Duncan, for that quick question. Um, I think it was Suzanne who mentioned the, the new French scale of repairability introduced recently. If, if you've got information about that that you could provide to the committee, that would be very helpful. Um, if not, I'm sure our clerks can dig it out. So that concludes our uh, second panel today. I'd like to thank our witnesses, uh, Suzanne, Martin and Ugo, very much for your insightful contributions. To apologise to the committee and our witnesses for uh, yet another technical failure of my broadband provider and to thank Alex Sobel in particular for picking up the baton um, on the run, as it were. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for an excellent session and to Nick Davis and the other clerks who helped put together the briefing for this session. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.